And hello, I am Mike Bird at Ridley College, and I am with my good friend, Professor Jarvis Williams from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, greetings to you, uh, Jarvis, in Kentucky. Greetings from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you. G greetings to you, brother. Enjoy it's a joy to be with you. Yeah. Man, I'm been, I've been reading your book, Redemptive Kingdom Diversity, and man, I am loving it. This is, it is a great survey on the people of God in the Old Testament, the New Testament. So it's great almost as like a, a, an introduction to ecclesiology, you know, the, the, the doctrine of the people of God across the Old and the New Testament. But of course, you're not doing this in a cultural vacuum or in, in isolation from wider issues. You're doing it in light of current events around the world, which is discussions about race, uh, ethnicity, immigration, where we have uh, debates about systematic uh, racism, that kind of a thing. And th these are hot button issues, not just on CNN or on Fox, but you know, in our churches, on social media, people are debating these kind of issues. And I mean, you give a great survey of, uh, of what the Bible says about the kingdom of God. And, and you know, I, I want to ask just a, initially a few questions about you know, the people of God in the Bible. Uh, one of them I got to ask, and this was sort of the itching question, is, you know, if, if as, as you allege, God's plan is for the nations to be united under him and in Christ, that's, that's, that's where the story is going to, that's where the progressive revelation is taking us. What do you do with passages like in Ezra, where the Israelites in the post-exilic period are told not to intermarry with, you know, with, with the locals, okay, mm -hmm. uh, where there's some serious charges? What, what, what do you do with that, with that sort of stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one thing that we need to remember when we were looking at the, the two covenants or the two testaments is that there's continuity and there's discontinuity. I think one of the things you see in the Old Testament particularly is this issue that, that Israel is set apart as a people of God, uniquely related to Abraham, uniquely, relate, uniquely demonstrate, demonstrating their relationship to Abraham as God's people by means of their observance of, of Torah. I think the issue related to ethnic separation as it relates to, to intermarriage relates, I think, fundamentally to Israel remaining faithful to Yahweh, faithful to her God, because the I think the great fear and the reality, I think, in the Old Testament was, is that if you mar intermarry with foreign women, they will lead you away to foreign gods. I think we see this in the case of Solomon and, and other, other places. So I think the fundamental issue in, those te in that text or in those text um, is not an issue of, of, of there's a sort of, an, of, of a racist sort of idea being advocated, but more so it's a preservation of the people of God to be faithful to their God as a light to the nations. And then, of course, as you move into the New Testament era, you begin to see that the, the way in which the people of God are defined are no longer marked off by uh, Torah, but they're marked off by faith in Jesus, marked off by the Spirit, and Jews and Gentiles in Christ can not only worship together, but they can also marry one another uh, in the Lord. So I think that's how I would try to answer that question, is that fundamentally it's a, an issue of covenant keeping and God wanting his people to be faithful to him and to his law, and one means by which that faithfulness would be realized would, would be not marrying uh, women who are uh, of uh, outside of the people of Israel. Okay, well, thanks for that answer, Jarvis. Uh, moving to the New Testament, there's some big highlights. Obviously, one text that looms large in the discussion is, you know, Acts 17, where it mentions, you know, from one blood, you know, Paul's sermon in the Are Areopagus, you know, from one blood, Paul has made all nations. Uh, when I read, read Lisa Bowen's book on African-American hermeneutics or the interpretation of Paul, uh, I was amazed that that verse was the real prominent one, not something like Galatians 3.28. Um, you know, that, that does dovetail with my own context a bit because that same verse was very uh, important and prominent in the uh, interaction between Christianity and the indigenous peoples of Australia. In fact, a guy called Josh Harris wrote a book called from uh, called One Blood, you know, based on that entire verse. Um, what do you think is the significance of, of that statement that Paul makes? And, and, and why has it become such a key verse in the Christian tradition when you're dealing with 
the interface between, in some cases, of the colonizer and the colonized, or when different groups meet together. Yeah, that's good. I think one reason why that verse is important is because Paul is touching on the fact that we all we all are the offspring of Adam. We all are human beings created in the image of God, and we flow from the same father, if you will, and the same mother. And I think, of course, you know, the, the world is repopulated through the through the loins of, of Noah after the flood. But the point I think would be is that fundamentally we are all human. Now that does not mean that there is no ethnic distinctions that we maintain in our humanity, but but we are all human. And in that humanity, there is no racial hierarchy that we are all beautifully created, as I said earlier, in God's image. So the the emphasis being placed on that humanity that we share, that, that same humanity that we share, is a powerful apologetic against issues like racism, I think, issues of, in the case of um, you know, slavery in my context, in the American context, that, that there's no racial hierarchy within the human race, that certainly there's ethnic difference, but there's no inferiority or superiority because we all flow from the offspring of Adam, all created in the image of God. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And that's the Christian contribution. Um, you know, I think it's probably certainly in line with um, the Jewish tradition as well, that, that there is not a natural hierarchy of human beings. Whereas in other cultures, you know, that's precisely uh, what there is. And e even to this day, you know, people can think of their own uh, race, ethnicity or culture as the one that should be dominant or at least dominant in, in that part of the world. And that the Christian story building on the both the Jewish scriptures and then the way it gets applied by uh, Paul and the apostles is, is very much about breaking down or destroying the idea of a hierarchy within humanity. Um, I'd say that's behind something like Galatians 3.28. But that leads me to another Pauline passage, where, which is the one I think is the, uh, the pristine example of uh, Paul's view of the people of God of multi-ethnic is, is Ephesians. Now, Paul, of course, is, it can root this very much in the atonement. I know that's, that's a subject near and dear to your heart, Jarvis. You've written some great stuff on the atonement, the extent of the atonement, uh, the different sort of um, the background to the images of sacrifice in the New Testament. I mean, uh, readers and listeners can go um, check out uh, those resources elsewhere. What does Ephesians contribute to our, our understanding of the people of God? Because when people think of Ephesians, they think either that big prayer in chapter one, you know, of election, uh, chapter, bit of chapter two, you've got being saved by grace, you know, then we've got the famous, um, you know, household codes in, in, in chapter five. Uh, what does Ephesians contribute to our view of the people of God? Yeah, that's good. You know, speaking of chapter, chapter one, I mean, Paul starts the body emphasizing that we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, and he he uses this language of, of election and, and, and choice and inheritance that was applied to, to Israel in the Old Testament. And now he's applying it to Jews and Gentiles in Christ, that, that numerous, uh, those numerous references to in Christ, God did this and in Christ, God did that. But then when you move into chapter two, verses one through 10, he, he begins talking about how we were all dead in trespasses and sins. And he includes himself as a Jew within that group of people who were dead along with Gentiles in trespasses and sins. And then in chapter 2, 11 through 22, particularly, he makes the point that, that the promises of God uh, given to Jews are, are realized and fulfilled through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and that Gentiles, by Jesus's death and resurrection, are brought in to, to receive those promises, so that the blood of Jesus, as Paul outlines the argument in chapter 2 of Ephesians, his death is the means by which the dividing wall of, the, of Torah between Jew and Gentile has now been broken down, and that Jews and Gentiles are now recreated into one new humanity, one new man, one new people, filled with different ethnicities, but yet they're one. They're, they're transformed. Their ethnic identity is transformed but not erased because of the blood of Jesus uh, and it's the cross of Jesus, that, and of course the resurrection uh, makes that a reality. And, and consequently, because of the death of Christ, uh, 
uh, dying to, to deal with the wrath of God for Jews and Gentiles, dying to reconcile Jews and Gentiles to God and to one another, dying to restore uh, creations, um, uh, to restore creation and, and bringing to restoration when Adam and Eve lost. Consequently of that death, Jews and Gentiles are filled with the same spirit. And they are not only now able to worship God together as the church, but God himself lives in them by the power of the Spirit. And I think all of that is because of the death of Jesus on the cross and, of course, the resurrection. And although in Galatians, Paul has a has sort of a different point he's making, he does make the point that the cross of Jesus, chapter 3, verse 13, is the means by which the Spirit comes to Jews and Gentiles by, by faith. So to me, it seems as though Jesus' death on the cross, his substitutionary death, and of course the resurrection are are foundational to this, this multi-ethnic reality uh, for which Jesus died and rose again. Yeah, that's excellent. That's a great, that's a great exposition. I particularly like what you said that like ethnic identity is not like erased or cast, it's transformed. And I, I think that's the key thing because we can think as if, you know, um, you know, the idea that ethnic identity or um, ethnic differences somehow cease to exist in Christ. Mm -hmm. that, that's not quite true. Those, those things don't, um, don't, don't cease to exist as if we reach some sort of, you know, um, weird, um, you know, rac racial, um, oh, what do you call it? Like, like, like you took all the colors of the rainbow and just smashed them all together. And that's who we are, which, which is what I think I happen. I, I think the idea of um, racial like equality in certain um, secular circles, they seem to seem to think, you know, being, you know, colorblind or something like that uh, but we, we do we do somewhat keep our I identities as male or um, you know anglo black uh, hispanic but the important thing is that they're transformed okay and they're not used and i think that that transformation is means they're not hierarchicalized and we can't say that i'm a bit closer to the throne of god because i'm x or anything like that and everything about ourselves is meant to be put in service to God and in service to uh, each other. I mean, I mean that, that that'd be close to your understanding of, 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 how, of what you're arguing for about these things being trans. I mean, is that what you mean by the transformation of our ethnic identity? Yeah, yes, that's part of what I mean. Yeah, and one of the things I try to do, as you know, as you know, in the book is, you know, make trying to help the reader understand. And I'm speaking from my my social location in the United States. That when we talk about the concept of race and the concept of ethnicity, we're talking we're having two different conversations. Often we conflate that language mm. to make them synonymous. But in the American narrative, that word race is a category. It's a social construct created for the purpose of racial hierarchy that sought to establish a hierarchical um, structure within the human race. And that's roughly a 17th century sort of invention. But ethnicity is much older than that. Ethnicity doesn't, doesn't refer to this, this ontological deficiency or superior inferiority. It speaks more to issues of um, culture, geography, language, values, and so on and so forth. So when I read the scriptures, it seems to me that ethnic diversity was uh, a part of God's good design from the very beginning. He anticipated, in other words, that human beings would be fruitful and multiply, and that there would be diversity amongst humanity, ethnically speaking, that there would be different tongues and tribes, so on and so forth. But then that diversity is fragmented when sin enters creation, and it begins to, to to relate wrongly to one another so that the problem is not ethnic diversity. The problem is sin creating division because of diversity. Uh, but then as you move into like the American context, which later you have this idea of race being invented. And so then what I'm suggesting is, is that uh, although there's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation between race and ethnicity in scripture, that the gospel speaks into both of those realities because the redemption that God has accomplished for us in Jesus is making every tongue, tribe, people, and nation into one new humanity. And it's also making those who have been, who have been racialized to be uh, inferior or superior based on a so-called racial hierarchy. It's shattering that false 
um, assertion and it's making the wrongs right with respect to both ethnic division and racial division. And in Christ Jesus, the, the transformation that takes place is not that my skin color is now erased and it's not apparent or that my ethnic heritage is no longer apparent. It's that in Christ Jesus, I'm still a Gentile, but I'm a transformed Gentile, a transformed Christ follower with fellow Jews and Gentiles with, with, bl with black and white and, and red and, and Asian and different dialects. And so we can, we can celebrate everything about our ethnicity in Christ that is in accordance with the Spirit, and we take off everything about our old identities that's contrary to the Spirit. So when I talk about that transformation, not eradication, I simply mean that I'm still an African-American man in Christ Jesus, but I'm a transformed African-American man so that you are my brother as a person who doesn't share my ethnicity. You're my brother in Christ. And, my, and the expectation and the uh, command is to love you as a brother and someone who might share my ethnic identity, but who is not a Christian, we have a different kind of relationship. My kinship with you is much deeper because it's rooted in what God has done for us in Jesus. Now, there are real kinships that I have with those who share my ethnicity. Paul says, I have this great passion, right, for my kinsmen according to the flesh. Uh, but there's something about kinship in Christ Jesus that we share as those from different ethnicities that's only able to be experienced because we've been transformed in Christ, which therefore means who we are in Jesus is the most important kinship that we share. And that then requires us to make certain sacrifices, requires us to make certain, um, uh, to, to love one another in a selfless, sacrificial way in the same way Jesus loved the world. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Well, that's terrific. That, that, sound, that sounds fantastic. Now, I've got to say, Jarvis, uh, you, you give a great survey of you know, the people of God in the Old and New Testament. But uh, for me, my favorite chapter was the last one where you kind, kind of get down into the, the practical imp implications of what this means in light of you know, the, the various debates about race and, and those kind of things. Um, let, let, let me ask you to explain. I mean, you talk a little bit about what is systematic racism. Now, this is, this is a very, very disputed term. Um, you know, wh when we talk about systematic racism, could you say what do we mean and what do we not mean? Yeah. Good. And by we, I mean basically you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I think, you know, one of the challenges, in, especially in the American context, in having these kinds of conversations is language is so fluid like we don't we, we're using different same words that have different meanings that we're attaching to those words and so it's, it's helpful for us to, to try to define what we mean when we talk about these things so so i'm going to speak for myself um, I, when i when i say systemic racism i i do not mean that um every aspect of american life is intentionally seeking to keep blacks down. Um, I, I do not mean that the deck is stacked against black people because of the color of their skin or against other minorities. I, I do not mean that by virtue of my being black, I am, I am therefore oppressed and, and that those who aren't black are the oppressor. That's not what I mean. I'm a middle-class black man with a PhD I'm a very privileged black man. Uh, I have a lot of privileges that poor whites don't have in my, in my country. So there are other negatives I could say, not this, uh, uh, but let me speak to the, but that. Let me say, this is what I, what I do mean. When I talk about systemic racism, I simply mean that at a particular time in, in the American narrative, co colonial narrative into the, what became the United States, you, you have intentional overt efforts to uh, dehumanize Blacks in, and keep them in their so-called place and other people of color uh, in, in society. You have slavery that's working to do that. You have, um, uh, in, during the Reconstruction period that happens, during the Jim Crow era, you have a, 
you have an overt system that's trying to control the destiny of black people because of the color of their skin. So systematically, there were things in place to keep blacks down, if you will, at one time in our history. But in spite of that, you had a flourishing black middle class. It's amazing, black people, the story of blacks in, in, in my country is not simply or only rather a story of slavery. In fact, I would argue that that is racist and unhelpful if the only thing you think blacks uh, have experienced is, is slavery. There's a, there's a beautiful story, a story of both uh, redemption, but also a story uh, of, of pain. There's joy and pain in the story as it relates to black people. And there's a black middle class that flourishes even in the time of overt systemic racism in, in, in the Jim Crow era. There are free blacks, uh, even in the time of, of slavery. And blacks were creating things, right? But here's the point related to the modern conversation about systemic racism. So the laws changed and there was then intentional efforts that were put in place in order to create the opportunities for blacks and other people of color to be able to have what we call equal opportunity. But the effects of those overt systemic uh, laws of the past still plays a role in certain contexts that negatively impact black people. And, and one example I give in the book, I think is, a, is, a, is an obvious example, is the example known as redlining. Now redlining is very complex. I'm not a political scientist or an economist, but basically a redlining in this country was a, was a systematic way of keeping blacks isolated in certain parts of, of segregated communities, and especially in, in urban communities. And there were, the, the blacks didn't have access to certain loans and wealth to be able to, to buy homes and, and to, to flourish in terms of their living situation. And so those communities be, began to be isolated, deprived of certain resources and that affected those communities uh, in terms of their education, in terms of their health, uh, crime, so on and so forth. So today, some of those communities still exist. So even though the laws have changed, we can say the effects of racism still, the effects of overt systemic racism of the past still negatively impact certain communities of color, even though there are not overt racists working in the housing industry, for example, or even if there are not laws in the books now that discriminate against blacks. The effects of that overt system are present today so that you have systemic racism, by which I mean racism by consequence. Not that individuals are making decisions necessarily to discriminate against black people, but there was something put in place in the past that affected those communities in the present that was the result of racism. Does that, does that make sense? It does, it makes perfect sense. And that allows us to distinguish between what is you know the current law and how the the history or the heritage still impinges on the present and that there are certain aggregate discriminations and disadvantages that accrue that are not legally enshrined but are nonetheless make themselves um, present mm -hmm. that's I, I think I think I think the, the example of red lying um, is, is a good is, is a good example. Uh, even though the legal discriminations uh, have gone, the effect of the prior ones still cast a shadow over the present and, and they can be felt, even though, um, you know, uh, me as a white guy, you know, I don't see it because I, I don't experience it. And, you know, and I, and I, I think that's one of the things, you know, you've got to understand that, you know, you know different, pe different people experience the world differently. Um, no. You know, um, you know, I, I, someone, I heard this story from when, um, Somebody asked a, a, a friend of mine, you know, when you get pulled over by a police car, what are you thinking about? And he goes, well, how much is the fine going to cost? And a black guy said, when I get pulled over, I'm worrying if I'm going to be alive in 10 minutes. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a different way of experiencing um, the world. We have different concerns based on, you know, where we are in the world and, and how we're treated. Um, that, well, you if I that, may, I can also give a clarifying point here. You know, this is something else that you notice in the conclusion. I want to make it very clear that that uh, black people and all, all people 
have personal agency. Uh, personal responsibility is important. So, so even though there are certain communities that are impacted by, by, by racism because of the systemic effects of it, that there's, they still have a personal responsibility to make the right choices, to, to work hard, to, to, to do whatever they can uh, uh, within, within the parameters of, of, of what is virtuous and good and right. To, to try to rise above their situation and to, uh, to overcome. I mean, the whole, one of the beautiful uh, narratives, I think, in this country of Black people is, is the, and, and, and all people, but particularly talking about uh, people of color who have been overtly discriminated against, although racism is not limited to, to people of color. One of the beautiful stories is this ability of the human uh, uh, being to overcome dire circumstances. So I, I want your, your listeners to understand that even though racism is a reality, uh, that people can overcome. I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a middle-class black man with a PhD and moreover, not all black people suffer from systemic racism. That's not the argument that, that I'm making. I'm making the simple argument that systemic racism is still a reality for certain black communities. But even still, or certain communities of color, but even still there is an opportunity with God's help, with the with the uh, with, with the appropriate resources, and with um, with with opportunities presented, that people can overcome. But but the challenge that that is there for certain people in certain communities, there's a there's a there, there are more things to overcome than there will be for others in other communities. Uh, my my son again is very privileged. He has much less to overcome in his life. Than poor whites in in eastern Kentucky, for example, in Appalachia, uh, and he has much less to overcome than than uh, people of color who are in very difficult situations uh, for no fault of their own. Uh, but the point that I want to emphasize here is is that personal responsibility is still important. Uh, but but we need to also recognize there are real realities that that certain people experience and face because of the effects of racism that are no fault of their own. Uh, a, a little baby boy wasn't chosen, did not choose to be born into a certain community that has these effects mm. uh, that are present in that community. We have to realize that that's a reality. Yeah. I mean, I, I can relate to that. I mean, I grew up um, as a child in a mixture of sort of welfare and working class suburbs. And, um, you know, that there were certain... Um, you could say there's a bit of a system kind of rigged uh, against you in certain ways, but you know, one thing I, I grew, I learned from growing up in, you know, like in some like welfare and working class areas is that you can also make life a whole lot worse by making bad choices. Yes. You know, I mean, so yeah. you, know, you can have a system that is against you. If, if life, if life deals you with some bad cards, um, you can play them well, or you can play them badly. And, you know, and I've, I've been in context where people of you know, all different races, I saw some played, the, some people were dealt bad hands, and they played them well, and some people, you know, played them very badly. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely true. There's an element of, of responsibility um, and trying to fight the odds and make a, make a better place for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree fully. Uh, one part of the book, which I thought was very courageous, Jarvis, uh, and by the in, I don't know if you know the TV show, Yes Minister, but courageous can also mean kind of like suicidal. Um, is, you, you don't just talk about the system, systematic racism experienced by African-Americans. You also talk about the type of racism exhibited by minorities against other minorities okay and and, uh, and against whites racism and, and, and against whites i remember i'm, I'm familiar oh, this is i know whether you'll find this funny or um, interesting but the first time i heard farrakhan speak on uh, like an, on a tv show the first thing i remember thinking to myself is man you do not need to be white to be racist that was that was the first thing i learned from listening to farrakhan um, but there's also been uh, in the United States a, uh, several incidences of anti-Asian racism, mm -hmm. and that can come from um, whites, it can come from blacks. Uh, there was a book that was published a while ago called In Defense of Looting, and the author did something which it, I, I did not think it was possible. She found a way to combine anti-Semitism mm -hmm. 
and anti-Asian racism. And she was saying, uh, you know, when um, Korean businesses were being attacked or being looted by largely um, um, you know, Blacks in, in California in the 1990s, she's, she justified it on the grounds that Koreans are the new Jews. You know, uh, the Jews were the face of capital in the 1960s and Koreans were the face of capital in the 1990s. And so if she's kind of justified looting Korean businesses on the grounds they were just the new Jews. And I mean, I, I couldn't believe that. That was, I, I could not even imagine a way of combining anti-Semitism and anti-Asian racism, um, you know, in, in the one paragraph, but she did it. Um, could, could you speak, can you speak to that topic for us, Jarvis? You know, uh, you know with that racism and prejudice is not just a, a white sin. It can also happen in other communities. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, one of the things I try to, to make clear in the book is, is that racism fundamentally exists because of sin, fundamentally. And, and racism, the way in which it operates, in, is going to look differently in different cultures and contexts, different countries, for example. And I, I, I think that uh, different people might have different nuance related to the differences between ethnocentrism, racism, racial prejudice, racial discrimination. But part of what I'm arguing in the book is that all of those things are, are related to, to racism. Now, I think when we're talking about racism in um, the American context, historically, there's a specific kind of historical connection related to the black-white divide and how race was a social construct that was created for that uh, for the purpose of dehumanizing uh, the enslaved black body, uh, the enslaved African, and prioritizing uh, those who were racialized as white, that in the American context, that was sort of the the uh, the way in which we get this racism or race uh, these categories uh, emerge. But but racism is not limited to the black white divide. So so I argue in the book because racism is is a sin. It's, it's a personal transgression. It's also, I think, a structural issue, but it's also a personal transgression fundamentally that racism is cross-cultural, if you will. So you have uh, white racism, black racism, uh, Asian racism, Hispanic, Hispanic racism. It's a, it's a, as I say in the book, it's a universal problem because sin is a universal problem. And moreover, it's not, uh, racism is not only to be connected to power because people without power can be racist. So that racism, of course, is connected to issues of power historically, but because of how sin works cosmically in order to alienate people because of their, their uh, uh, real or perceived uh, ethnicity. You have blacks who hate whites, whites who hate blacks, blacks who hate blacks. You have issues of colorism amongst minority communities. Mm. Uh, in, in the, that, that is light-skinned uh, uh, blacks, for example, uh, uh, racially discriminating against dark-skinned blacks and, and vice versa. Uh, in in, in the, the United States, you, you have, as you mentioned, this, this rise of, of anti-Asian racism. And, and uh, one time, um, uh, my, most, my most recent uh, check of the data that most of the anti-Asian uh, racism incident, uh, incidents were uh, Blacks and Hispanics who were uh, committing racist acts against Asians. It wasn't uh, primarily whites doing that. So, so one of the thing I, things I'm trying to say is, is that racism is much worse than we think because it's a cosmic problem because of the universal power of sin. But the solution in terms of God's redemptive vision is much better than what we think because Jesus Christ has worked to redeem tongues and tribes and peoples and nations. And that doesn't mean when people become Christians that racism all, all of a sudden goes away. I mean, we, we have a whole history, don't we, of people professing Christ and being perpetrators of racism. Uh, but it does mean that in Christ Jesus, that there is hope that these groups of people that are alienated because of racism and, and, and ethnic division, that that divide can be healed. 
And, and so when we began to understand then that racism is much bigger than the black white divide and that it, it, is, it is fundamentally a, a problem because of sin and how sin operates in a variety of cultures and communities, then it helps us to understand that, 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 that it is fundamentally a spiritual problem, not simply a problem related to issues of power. So the powerless can be racist, not in the same way as the powerful, but racism, but racist nevertheless. Okay. Thanks. That, well, that's, that's, that's very, very illuminating. I'm sure people will appreciate that. Um, se second last question on this. Um, you talk a bit of, uh, in your book about mutual responsibility, okay, mm -hmm. as one of the antidotes to dealing with you know, all the various different types of racism. Can you unpack what you, for us what you mean by mutual responsibility? Yeah, it's good. That is, that's not unique to me. I, in the book, I cite um, a, a sociologist, a Christian sociologist, uh, George Yancey, spelled with uh, E-Y, he spells his last name with an E-Y, Yancey. Uh, there's another George Yancey, but this, is, this particular one is a Christian sociologist, and he wrote a book in 2006 called Beyond Racial Gridlock. And, and one of the, the things he argues for in the book is, is that Christians need to take human depravity seriously, and we need to take the gospel seriously as we think about issues related to race, but then he also begins to talk about practical outworking of that. He, he talks about mutual responsibility, by, by which he means, um, uh, in, a very, in a very simple way I'll, I'll explain, by which he means that we all need to understand that we bring, we bring something to the table uh, that we can contribute, and we all have a responsibility to to, to make things, things better. So mutual responsibility is, is uh, people from different ethnicities recognizing that we need to use our energies and our efforts to partner together to think of what can we do together? What can we agree, agree upon mutually to serve one another so that we can flourish and, and see some kind of change as it relates to the issues of, of race and racism. One of the things he, he uh, points out is how if, if the posture is that uh, the responsibility or the burden is on one group of people in this conversation, then that, can, that, will, that posture will only serve the needs of those to whom uh, the group, the, the one group who's being held responsible, those needs that that group is, is meeting. And, and that doesn't create space for a collaboration. So mutual responsibility says we all, we, we, we don't bring equal things to the game in terms of equal experiences of racism or even equal resources, but we all uh, bring uh, goodwill to the conversation and we should partner together and focus on the things that we can do together collectively as, as I think as, as humanity, but also as Christians from different tongues and tribes and peoples and nations and mutually care about one another's best interests together. And, and with that posture, we can see more, more progress in terms of the racial divide versus being uh, in a screaming match with with different sides of people uh, placing demands on the one side or the other side doing that uh, to, the, to, the, to the opposing side. So by mutual responsibility, this, this, everybody has skin in the game. We're all responsible in this. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to put it. Okay, uh, last question I've got for you, one, and this is, this is a real life story, okay? Uh, I had, I had a, uh, an American friend who was a bit of a, uh, like a mentor to me. He was a, a um, Southern Baptist pastor. Um, he was in the U.S. and um, he was offered to be the lead pastor of a church. Uh, but when he spoke to the church, when he investigated it, uh, he found out that they were a white church in what was becoming a black majority area. And he said he would only agree to pastor the church if they moved the church into a white area. And you know, when, I, when I heard this, I thought this is just so racially um, partisan. You know why not? Why not grow a white and black church uh, together? And he said, "You just can't do it. You can't grow a white church in a black area 
he says white people don't want to go to a to a multicultural church they don't want to go to a church in the black here and he says and black people don't want to go to a white church uh and he said this is this is just the he says it's not ideal but this is this is the way it is on the ground you know if you want to grow a church or have a successful church you, this is the way it is um yeah and I, I was really disappointed i mean again it's okay for me to pontificate i don't live in that context uh, but I mean, I was I was kind of disappointed because I, I felt like he was capitulating to the racial divides rather than having a redemptive kingdom vision of what the church looks like. Uh, what what I mean, Jarvis, what would you have said to uh, to to my to my friend if he if if you had heard about his strategy? What would what would you have said to that? That's good. Yeah, I would I would acknowledge uh, in agreement with him that this is the reality that it is true in, in the American context that there's still this very strong divide between blacks and whites. I mean, the history, uh, I'm not a church historian, as you know, but the history of, of the black church uh, cannot be separated in the American context from being resistant to overt racism. That's one of, the, one of the reasons why you get the black church is because blacks weren't welcomed in white churches and they formed their own denominations and their own, own churches. And you still feel that in our, in our country. So I would acknowledge, yes, that is the historical reality. However, I would also say that if, if a, a congregation, a, a, a monoethnic congregation is in a, a, a multi-ethnic community or in a community that is, is majority not the ethnic demographic of that mono-ethnic congregation, that the church should, I think, seek to re-envision what it means for them to be a church in that community and seek to, uh, to reflect the, the diversity that they find in the community, by which I mean the church should not be a building built on top of a community, but it should be a church that is seeking to, yes, bring life into that community, people from the outside coming in, but also care about those image bearers in that very community in which the church exists. And part of what that means is, is that the vision of the church and the, the mission of the church needs to be consistent with their their demographic reality in the community. I think that uh, people in the church would need to get to know the folks in the community, uh, uh, go around and, and knock on doors and, and have conversations in order to, to, to establish credibility with the community so that the redemptive vision that is outlined in scripture could be realized in that context. Now, I wanna also make this statement that it's also true that you don't have to have a multi-ethnic church to, to care about redemptive kingdom diversity or even to pursue redemptive kingdom diversity. You can be a mono-ethnic church that is deeply invested into seeing God's vision of redeeming the nations uh, and, and how you use your resources, how you, how you serve your larger, the, the larger global Christian community. Uh, so multi-ethnicity in terms of local churches, that's not the only way in which this vision has worked out. But if you are a monoethnic congregation in a context that is ethically different from that congregation, then that particular congregation should intentionally pursue this redemptive university by seeking to uh, live out the gospel in a way that invites that diversity to enter in to the story of that congregation. Otherwise, you're, you're just a, a congregation built on top of a community with no, with no investment into that actual demographic that's there. And yes, it will be hard. It will be difficult. I mean, multi-ethnic churches have multi-ethnic problems. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm one of the pastors of a multi-ethnic church that's, that is similar to what you've just described. It's uh, we're a predominantly Black community but we're predominantly white congregation that is increasingly becoming multi-ethnic. The church has been in existence for 20 years, and we just recently, a few years ago, moved into the community that, that uh, we currently reside in. And so there's beauty to becoming a multi-ethnic uh, 
Kingdom Diverse Church, uh, but there's also pain there. But the joy that Jesus brings when that vision is lived out in, in, in multi-ethnic communities, uh, it, it surpasses the, and, and the, the pain that endures for a little while, if that makes, makes sense. And it is an apologetic for the gospel. When you have different tongues and tribes and peoples and nations worshiping together from different political postures, different financial postures, different ethnic postures, different educational postures, worshiping together, loving one another in one another's lives, that's a powerful apologetic for the gospel in that community and in, and in the world, I think. So that's some of the things I would, would have said. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Jarvis. Jarvis, it has been um, great talking to you. Uh, for those who are watching or listening, remember uh, the title of the book is Redemptive Kingdom Diversity. It's published by Baker Academic Press, and you can find it you know, at Baker, at Amazon, or wherever great books are sold. This is a book that I believe will possibly give you a renewed uh, ecclesiology, doctrine of the church, leave you to be better equipped to engage some of the difficult and hairy questions about, you know, what Jarvis has been talking about, about race, power, history, injustice, and all of its messiness. So I, I really hope you do check out this book because you will definitely benefit from it. The final chapter of the book alone is worth the price of the book four times over. So uh, definitely on, uh, on my recommended list for all, for all my friends and students and, and well wishes. Well, anyway, Jarvis, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, great to discuss this book with you. And I hope it gets uh, widely read uh, by, by people from you know, all, all walks and places of life, particularly in the churches. Thank you, Mike.